In addition to Colleen's um, data expertise, I also I appreciated her extensive knowledge of, of election law and the legislative process. And she gained that um, largely in an earlier position that she had with the Government Accountability Board. So um, this morning, Colleen is going to speak about how the electorate is changing and how the League can continue to engage citizens in the new elections environment. So thank you for being here, Colleen. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Andrea. Um, you know, I loved working with Andrea, and I hope all of you appreciate all the work that she does. Um, when I was at, yeah. When I was at the Government Accountability Board, and when, you know, sometimes you get some interesting people that show up at the meetings. Uh, <laughs> but when Andrea showed up, all the staff, we just used to sit up on our chairs, and we used to take Andrea very seriously. She is incredibly well respected. The League of Women Voters is probably the most well respected group when it comes to elections advocacy. So thank you so much for everything that everyone does in this room because it definitely pays off. People really appreciate in the Capitol and at our elections agency everything you do. So thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, Colleen Grzynski, uh, new Greater Green Bay member, new board member. I haven't even attended my first board meeting yet. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but my uh, career in politics and elections um, started about 14 years ago. I started um, in the Minnesota um, House of Representatives PAGE program. And then also I was the first election judge trainee for Mora County. I wasn't uh, 18, so they had to make me a trainee to serve as a poll worker. So if you wonder if your youth programs work, they do. I'm a testament um, that completely changed the course of my life and career. So um, I know a lot of you also are very active with youth programs and they make a huge difference. Um, I have my bachelor's degree in political science and Spanish from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. My master's in political science from um, the, oh, some pointers, <laughs> go points. I have my master's from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, so go Milwaukee. <laughs> um, and working at the GAB, I consider the highlight of my career. It was one of the most fantastic periods of my life, and I am devastated by what happened to that agency. Um, I work for a really great new corporate company called Target Smart out of Washington, D.C. They uh, do corporate political data. Uh, some of our clients include NBC. So if you uh, are ever watching NBC News and you see political data, it's something that my company probably produced. So um, sorry, I had to give a plug. They're really great. Uh, so, so let me grab, oh, clicker. Oh, we'll see if this works. Ooh, it works this morning, I was worried. So you're probably like emerging electorate. What is this emerging electorate I see on my, on my notes here? Um, it is, is a, there's a lot of different names that you'll hear the emerging electorate called. Um, sometimes emerging electorate, sometimes new American majority. Um, rising American electorate, uh, it's kind of a little fluid. And you'll see throughout my, my slides, I took a, a bunch of slides from presentations over the last two years, and so you'll see all three referred to, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but essentially, um, there's three main groups at the heart of the new American majority or emerging electorate or rising American electorate. Uh, one is unmarried women. The other are uh, communities of color and then also youth, which um, for the new American majority is 18 to 34. Uh, nationally, the new American majority is about 60% of the population, and so that's where you get the rising American elector majority because they're already the majority of the population. Um, but even though they're the majority of the population, they're not uh, voting as much as the rest of the, or the entire population. Nationally, registration is behind by 13 points compared to the total population. Um, and especially um, in the next slides I'll go over, it's, that's really worrisome because the new American majority is quickly becoming a larger percent of the population too. So, you know, there's a lot of voters that are being left behind nationally. You know, luckily in Wisconsin, 
uh, we have had really great participation. Um, so the new American majority is 51% of the population, so slightly lower than national average, but they vote at higher rates than the rest of the new American majority nationally. Um, there's still a registration gap at nine um, points, um, but that's still significantly lower than the national average for this group. So um, it, it's good, but we have some progress to do here in Wisconsin. And the new American majority, as I said, is quickly growing. Um, already in two years, by 2018, the majority of youth will be from communities of color. And when I say youth, that's um, individuals under the age of 18. Uh, actually, Asian Americans, um, this is the fastest growing population from 2000 to 2010. Um, migration patterns are changing, um, and there are now more immigrants from Asian countries than Latin America. And by 2043, which is only you know, one generation away, the U.S. will be majority people of color nation. According to U.S. Census by 2060, no racial group will make up a majority of the population. Uh, the Asian and Hispanic populations in the United States are expected to double. One in three people in 2060 are expected to be of uh, Hispanic descent. Black and Native American populations will also increase, but remain as a, a same percentage of the, be, uh, of the current population. So about in 2016, we or 2060, we expect the population um, for black communities across the nation to be about 14% and 1.5 uh, for Native American. So, you know, because of immigration, because of population changes, the rising American electorate is very diverse and growing in very different and distinct ways across the nation. Um, and already, you know, we don't have to wait to 2043 or 2060 to see the impact of the growing um, new American majority on our elections. Um, in 16 states, there could be more new Hispanic and Asian voters by 2020 than decided the 2012 presidential result in th that state. So already the new American majority has the potential to really swing the outcomes of elections in very significant ways across the nation. Um, this is a really great chart if you go to um, API Vote, which is a great nonprofit um, located out of DC, is Asian Pacific Islander Americans Vote. We um, do have a new chapter here in Green Bay, or not in Green Bay, in Wisconsin. Um, they have a lot of great data and you can kind of play around with fun things. So if you wanna get a little wonky afterwards. Uh, yeah, it's APIA Vote, Asian Pacific Islander Americans Vote. Um, and we can already see some significant population changes and are expecting uh, significant population changes in Wisconsin as well by 2020. So already, and this is according to the Partnership for a New American Economy, which if you go to APIA Votes website, they have links to this organization. But already in Wisconsin, we have 92,000 unregistered Asian and Latino voters in the state of Wisconsin. We are adding about 10,000 new eligible voters every year from 2012 to 2020. So by 2020, we're expected to add another 95,000 unregistered Asian and Latino voters in the state of Wisconsin alone. So these are huge population increases and changes. In Wisconsin, immigrants make up 4.7% of the population, and we saw a 40% increase of immigrants from 2000 to 2013. And the reason that I bring up immigration and citizenship status is because it actually has a very significant effect when it comes to uh, registration rates and then subsequent voting rates as well. So this is a national chart of voter registration participation broken down by race. Um, also, you'll see some terms on here, CVAP, that's a term that the US Census uses. It is the citizen voting age population, so everything, everyone over the age of 18 that is a US citizen. And this chart is nationwide, and um, this is from API Vote, and then also um, the 2012 US Census Current Population Survey. So, um, but you can see here, um, I wish I had a pointer, but <laughs> so, um, 
for um, white and black American citizen, citizenship rates are in the high 90s. And actually, when it comes to registration rates, CVAP registered means uh, citizen age voting population registered to vote. Um, they're equal at 73%. And actually, when it comes to um, black Americans that are registered to vote, they're actually voting at slightly higher rates than white Americans, um, 66 to 64%. And actually, we um, see um, some about pretty similar rates here in Wisconsin when it comes to our presidential and midterm elections, too. Um, but as you can see, when it comes to Hispanic and Asian Americans, the citizenship rate is almost 30% less in the high 30s. And this also has a very significant effect when it comes to registration rates. Uh, Hispanic and Asian voters are registered at 59 and 56% respectively, which then also means a decrease when it comes to uh, turnout at only 48 and 47%. So citizenship rates uh, significantly uh, affect, well, obviously, because you can't register to vote without being a U.S. citizen, but citizenship rates really uh, do have a significant effect on people's ability to participate in our, in our election process. Um, we are seeing some changes, especially in 2016. I haven't seen anyone quantify it yet, um, but especially in Hispanic communities, some Hispanic communities um, have been outraged about what's been happening in our political process this year. And so we're actually seeing quite a few um, Hispanic um, uh, citizens go out and become naturalized and go through the citizenship process. So I think especially in the next two years, we're gonna see these numbers change. So how does this all compare? You know, we've been talking nationally for most of the morning. You know, how does this compare to Wisconsin? And uh, in, in 2014, um, it was an interesting election when, it, when you compare what happened nationally to what happened in Wisconsin. Uh, so in 2014, nationally, we saw a decrease in turnout for the 2014 midterm election, with only actually about 36% of the voting eligible population going to vote. And when I say voting eligible population, these are individuals over the age of 18. Um, it takes into account citizenship status. It also takes into account incarceration. So it's um, a slightly smaller subset of the voting age population or the citizen age voting population. But um, even though this is, this is really sad, that 36% makes me really sad. <laughs> but this was actually mostly because of larger states like California, New York, and New Jersey, who had significantly lower turnout. So these large population states really drove down the average nationally. But there's still really actually good news coming out of 2014. Turnout increased in 14 states compared to 2010, the last midterm election. And Wisconsin actually had the second highest increase out of any state in the nation. So I think clap to all of you. <laughs> so that's really good. Um, 2014 was actually the highest turnout on record for a midterm since the 1940s. Um, and it was about 55%. So still significantly lower than we'd like to see it, but definitely progress. It was uh, a nine point increase over 2010 turnout. So um, we're definitely going in the right direction. And actually there's some other good stats that I didn't put up here about uh, what happened in 2014. So our absentee and same day registration rates also have been increasing over the last six years. This is really interesting because some states like Minnesota are actually seeing decreases in terms of individuals taking part in absentee voting. So the, I, when I was talking to the Minnesota data manager, I was like, really, really, it's, it's decreasing in Minnesota? I'm from Minnesota, so I'm like, <laughs> so I'm very proud of Minnesota's voting uh, participation rates, and I was kind of sad to see that. Um, but we're setting records in other elections here in Wisconsin. The 2012 presidential uh, turnout was higher than 2008, which is the opposite of most states. Uh, the 2012 uh, gubernatorial recall was the highest turnout for a special election in Wisconsin. And 2016 uh, spring election had the highest turnout for a spring election since 1980. So th those increases really 
uh, indicate that there is a healthy electorate here in Wisconsin. We still have a ways to go, but we're making progress. We're on the right track. Um, and studies have shown that if people participate in two of three consecutive elections, they're very likely to make to be a voter for life. Uh, so this is really good. It makes 2016 fall election really exciting. I think we could actually see some records here when it comes to our upcoming fall election and then also subsequent elections across uh, the next couple years. Um, so I talked about Wisconsin in total, but how did the rising American electorate, how did the emerging electorate do in 2014? Um, so overall, the entire voting eligible population of Wisconsin is 4.24 million. Um, we went over what the rising American electorate is, you know, women, youth, communities of color. Um, the RAE represents 53% of the total voting eligible population of Wisconsin. Now, of the rising American electorate, 30, uh, slightly over 30% voted in the 2014 election, which is good. Um, you know, this was an increase, but it's still not where the entire population is. Is If the entire po population is voting on average about 55% in the rising American electorate is still only performing at 30%, you know, that's a really significant deficit especially when you consider that the rising American electorate is, makes up over half of the, the um, voting eligible population in Wisconsin. So, you know, um, I'm gonna go over the next couple slides to show where we saw improvements. Um, we're, we're on the right track when it comes to the rising American electorate, but definitely more needs to be done. And so this is really small, and I'm sorry, this is a lot of data. Um, I think, do they have slides in there? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I can send you larger copies if anyone wants it, so it's probably still really small on the page, too. Um, <laughs> I tried to fit too much in. Um, so when we break down the turnout of the rising American electorate by race, um, we see some really good trends compared to 20. 10, 2012, 2014. So when it came to the 2014 midterm, um, when you look by race, all um, racial categories saw an increase, but it's still lower than white or Caucasian voters. The largest increase in turnout from 2010 was actually um, from the black community here in Wisconsin. If you notice at the bottom, total voters, we saw an increase of um, slightly over 4%. But when it comes to black communities across Wisconsin, we saw an increase of over 6%. So a huge increase compared to 2010, higher than average increase, which is really great to see. Um, and then um, we still have higher than average turnout when it comes um, to white voters, under turnout when it comes to Hispanic, Native American, and Asian voters. Um, some good news, though, is also um, Native American voters, we saw we're seeing some really significant increases, um, even though um, it's, they're still underperforming as a as a total community across Wisconsin. Uh, we saw an increase over the 2012 recall, um, which was the highest non-presidential -pres election um, turnout. And remember that 2012 gubernatorial had higher turnout than 2014. I think the gubernatorial recall was like 57 percent, and the midterm in 2014 was 55. So definitely, we see the rising American electorate making significant strides even in a two-year period. So that's really good to see. Um, I wish I had age data for you. Um, unfortunately, the state of Wisconsin does not release age data when it comes to voter registration forms. So it makes uh, uh, studying you know, how people are increasing when it comes to youth a little spotty and tricky. So, um, but hopefully we can get some be better data soon. So I know Tufts University out of uh, is working really hard in terms of collecting youth data, especially in Wisconsin. Um, so we talked about Wisconsin 2014, the RAE uh, statewide, but how is the RAE performing locally? Um, I chose one county. I actually have an analysis done for all counties. So if you actually talk to Wisconsin Voices, my former employer, they have all my former data. And uh, if you want something, your the rising American electorate broken down for your county, just let them know and they will give it to you. 
Um, but I took Milwaukee County, actually has the highest percentage of the rising American electorate um, out of all the counties. So again, this is on the 2014 midterm. Um, on the left-hand side, we have it broken down by race. And then actually, I took the opportunity to break it down by male versus female, because females are an important part of the rising American electorate. So one great thing is that no matter um, um, how you identify when it comes to race, women are outperforming men when it comes to voting. Uh, that was uh, really great to see. Women are definitely um, stepping up when it comes to voting. And actually, when you break it down by race and gender, um, black women voted at the highest rates in Milwaukee County than any other group. So it was really, really great to see. Um, also note that when it comes to a uh, percentage of the population, the black community and Asian community in Milwaukee County overperformed. If you look at the last column, these, these two numbers represent overperformance in terms of their actual percentage of the voting eligible population. Um, which then makes it kind of, you're like, okay, Milwaukee County has the highest rising American electorate, but statewide, we're still seeing like this huge underperformance. What's going on? And um, actually, unfortunately, in Wisconsin, when it comes to rising American electorate, you can see some huge discrepancies and differences when it comes to registration and turnout. Um, I didn't, it's not on here, but I worked with Asian Pacific Islanders, Americans vote, APIA vote, and created a slide for them showing this. And actually, depending on what county you're living in, um, API voters are voting and registering at half the rates compared to other places. So I looked at like the top five counties. Uh, Dane and Milwaukee County consistently have about 47% of their API communities registered and voting. Meanwhile, when you go to areas like Sheboygan, um, Brown County, Marathon County, it's in the mid to low 20s. Uh, so, you know, I think that really points to the fact that we really need the League of Women Voters. Be, um, and it's great that the League of Women Voters is an, a statewide organization because we're seeing some really si different uh, significant needs when it comes to our communities and the rising American electorate. And I think the League of Women Voters can play a really big role in terms of trying to even out those gaps. So why is the emerging electorate important? Why should we care? Um, I mean, well, yeah, they're over half the population, so naturally. <laughs> they're the fastest growing population. Um, but it, as the numbers have shown, you know, unfortunately, the emerging electorate is under, underrepresented in election turnout, especially when it comes to spring elections. And you know, we're just talking about elections here. We're not even talking about representation when it comes to elected officials. Uh, you know, in Brown County, my, my husband is on the Brown County board, and so is Kathy LaFay, one of our, our Green Bay members as well. And out of 26 board members, there's two women. Oh, there's three? Oh, wow, we, 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 we improved. We used to only have two, and now we have one. So, but still three women out of 26. Um, it's even worse when it comes to city of Green Bay. Is that one, one city council member? And on both the Brown County and City Council, we have uh, no individuals from communities of color. None. Um, and what, on Brown County, we have maybe two individuals under the age of 30 on the Brown County Board? And no one, yeah, okay, we'll bump it up and be generous and do 35. And then I don't think we have anyone under the age of 30 on the City of Green Bay Council either. So, I mean, we've been talking about voting, but when it comes to individuals running for office and getting elected, that's an even worse situation. Which, you know, if you're making up over half the population and you're not even, you know, that's what, ten, not even 10% <laughs> of the, the representatives, that's even, an even bigger problem. Um, but when also when it comes to why is the emerging elector important um, youth, is also very important. Actually, according to Tufts University, when it comes to the 2016 election, Wisconsin is ranked sixth out of the top 10 states where youth will have the greatest impact on the 2016 election. 
Um, youth represent over 21% of the voting eligible population under 30. And the presidential election turnout for individuals under 30 is expected to be 60%. Um, that's still lower than the national average of 70%. But um, still, the youth you know, in Wisconsin are going to play a huge role uh, when it comes to 2016. And sorry, there's no pun intended by saying huge like that. I just caught myself, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so, but um, you know, how can we engage the, emerging, uh, the, engage the new American major majority or the emerging electorate? Especially, you know, uh, we have to be honest with ourselves as an organization, you know, we we do not represent most of the rising American electorate. You know, I'm quickly aging out. I'm, I'm going to be 31. <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> I'm just slightly, I know, I'm just barely in the rising American electorate and I'm holding on. <laughs> so we used to joke, actually, in 2014, I think the rising American electorate was 30. And then all of a sudden, there's a, we have a bunch of staffers that were like right at the age of 30. And we're like, we'll bump this up to 34. We'll still be. <laughs> But you know, how, how do we engage the emerging electorate when we are not part of the emerging electorate? Um, so it, again, I am one person from the, I'm barely part of the rising American electorate. So I would encourage everyone, you know, I tried to put some just general things on here, but I, I think we need to really do more intentional conversations and get to know the needs of our community um, you know, I'm just one person, you know, there's, if you ask someone else from the Rising American electorate, they're going to give you very different answers. So, um, some things though that I think in general are important are authenticity, um, which I think 2016, our presidential election has shown people really are seeking individuals that they believe are authentic. Um, it's not about qualifications anymore. They want someone that they can relate to. Um, and, uh, there's been a lot of studies on, um, you know, um, messengers, and in terms of, you know, how how do people relate? How do people make decisions on who to support or what product to buy? And uh, case after case has shown the messenger matters. People are more responsive to individuals when they look like them. They are from their community. Um, they have similar values. So authentic, authenticity, and then I was talking to Ruth about this, and Ruth brought up something really important. In addition to authenticity, trust. People have to be able to trust the messenger. And then also, we need to meet the emerging electorate where they are. And I say, that's not only online. <laughs> A lot of people, especially youth, just assume, oh, we. If, if we want to register voters, we got to do Facebook ads. And I'm like, no, it's not just Facebook ads. Online is important, don't get me wrong, but it shouldn't take over other important programs like going and registering people in high schools, um, working with college campuses. Um, and increasingly, too, a lot of college campuses, you know, a lot of people can, in the Rising American Electric can't afford to go to college. A lot of youth can't afford to go to college. We're starting to see some. Um, lower uh, rates, when, especially when it comes to universities like University of Stevens Point. So we have to figure out how can we go to workplaces and other places where youth are other than just college campuses. And then also, don't go it alone. Coalition, coalitions of organizations are key. Um, you know, I work for Wisconsin Voices. We represent over 60 nonprofits across the state. And we represent, we worked with a diverse set of groups from Asian Pacific Islander Americans Vote um, uh, urban underground, <laughs> but it's important to work with organizations like uh, Wisconsin Voices because they do have organizations like Asian Pacific Islander Americans Vote or Native Vote, which is a great program. It's a C3 that goes and does voter registration on uh, reservations across the state. So it's important that we all work together and not go alone. And then. Some other uh, strategies to increase participation, um, use social pressure. There have been a ton of studies. If I hear one more social pressure study, I'm going to. But um, use, you know, use it. And when I say social pressure, uh, we're talking about um, reminding people, thank you for voting. Or, hey, you know, you, I see that you vote in every single election. Or, hey, do you know your neighbor votes in every single election? Um, 
you know, reminding every, you know, people, everyone is voting, you should too. Staying positive, not negative. I remember when I first started off in elections, the, the line was, um, oh, you know, we're expecting low turnout, so we really need you to go vote. Don't use that line. Studies have shown that doesn't work and it can actually decrease turnout, so be positive. Um, also help pre people by creating plans to get an ID or um, voting absentee. That's why those handouts, those handouts are awesome in terms of um, the handouts Andrea was talking about, in terms of helping prep people to vote so they know what they need. And then walking through the steps, asking people, do you know where your polling location is? Uh, are you going to drive? Is there parking? at polling locations. I used to do auditing for the GAB, and trust me, there's a lot of polling locations that don't have enough parking. And so walking people through and asking them those steps, like, oh, are you gonna bring your child with you? Oh, do you need daycare? You know, Those steps are really important. And then adjust to the needs of the community. Um, so um, you can really see this with API vote. Um, one, for an example with them, is uh, once registered Asian Pacific Islander communities vote at high rates. However, API communities register at lower rates. So API vote is putting more resources into registration instead of turnout. Um, you know, another example is, you know, students not having ID. You know, can we use enrollment and other data to identify and target individuals that need ID? Um, one example that was just fantastic that's um, not related to voting was I worked with APIA Vote to do a, like kind of like a civics training at the Hmong Community Center in Green Bay. And one thing that we heard over and over from the API communities there when we sat down with them was, you know, um, especially it's in Green Bay, it's a high um, population of, of Hmong. And the Hmong community leaders were saying, well, you know, we don't go to our elected officials because we don't want to seem that we're complaining. We're really grateful to be here and we don't want to seem like we're not grateful. So when we brought in our speaker, we had um, Blong Yang, who is the uh, city council member for city of Minneapolis. He's the first Hmong um, city council member for them and he drove four hours for a training. He's wonderful. And so when he got in front of our um, training group, he changed the framing of these events. And he said, look, you're a taxpayer. You're giving the government money. When you show up to my office, when you write a letter, when you go to my listening sessions, you're not complaining. You're telling me how you want your money used. And that just changing that framing completely changed the conversation and the community wanted to get more active. Um, so again, this is all about authenticity, trust, building relationships. And when you do that, you can increase participation and you can adjust uh, your pre presentations, you can adjust your tactics to what works in the community. Um, you know, this is hard. There's no magic bullet. There's not one universal bullet that's gonna work in all communities with everyone. It's definitely harder work, but definitely if you put the time in up front, you're going to see a significant um, increase in your investment, so. And I have to give a plug to data, because <laughs> I'm a data person. Um, you know, when I started off in elections, like, there was no um, database of voters. You had to pay $100,000 to some guy up in the UP to go get a list of voters. Um, now, organizations like Wisconsin Voices can provide that to you for free. So take advantage of it. Um, you know, targeting the new American majority is hard. Um, the new American majority moves around a lot more than other populations, so data can help you find people in the emerging electorate and new American majority. There's data on photo ID, um, some limited data on age, uh, gender, race, ethnicity, language data. Um, you know, API Vote has spent a lot of money in terms of putting models together that can tell if someone is um, Hmong, Chinese, uh, Loatian. So, use that data, it's there for you. And then two, um, these are some of the organizations and coalition, coalitions that if you want to start doing more work with the emerging electorate, you know, how can you reach out and find people? Uh, Wisconsin Voices is a great organization. Um, Native Vote, Matt Dannenberg is one of the nicest, most wonderful people. And um, I, 
contact him. He would love to come speak. He's he's gentle giant. I love him. And <laughs> and then API Boat is new in Wisconsin. Um, there's Zong Chang and Maihua Mua out of Milwaukee, and they're a fantastic couple. Zong Chang is actually from Appleton, so if there's any Appleton members. Song Chang would be happy to come talk to your groups because he has family up in, in Appleton and he he loves loves Appleton. So, and then also UW, UW Council of UW students um, and there's contact there. And then um, in terms of emails, contacts, Wisconsin Voices has contact information for all these groups. Otherwise, I know Andrea works with a lot of these individuals on a daily basis. So contact Andrea too. So. Um, you know, that, that's a lot of information, and so I think there's some questions that we need to decide as chapters going forward. You know, how can we increase diversity in our chapters if we know the messenger matters? What can we do to make sure that our chapters are reflective of the communities that surround us? Um, figuring out who is the new American majority in our area, it really differs depending on what part of the state you're in. For example, when it comes to race in Milwaukee County, um, the black community um, is the largest community of the rising American electorate there. But when you go to Brown County, it's actually Latino. So getting to know like what rising American electorate are in my communities um, is going to be very important. What ally organizations exist in our area? How can we empower and support each other without leading? You know, how can and this was uh, really great with APIA vote. You know, I really loved helping them get started here in this state. Um, but you know, it, I, it required me to step back as an individual and as an organization with Wisconsin Voices. So how could I step back and empower them to lead in their own community? And then how can we be st strategic with our resources? You know, we've been talking a lot about midterm and presidential elections, but. Um, the rising American electorate, where you see the biggest deficit in turnout, is actually spring elections. For example, in 2015, uh, the right, it was about 20% of the overall population participated in 2015. But when it came to the rising American electorate, it was less than 9%. So we have a long way to go when it comes to spring elections. So how can we be, be strategic with our resources when it comes to presidential versus, versus other elections that need our assistance. So um, that's all I had. I if people, <laughs> that's all, that's all, <laughs> a lot. So, but yeah, questions and, yeah. Okay, just a, a second, I'll give you the microphone oh. and that way the camera can pick up on the questions. Is your group doing anything regarding the redistricting issue regarding education? Yes, so uh, Wisconsin Voices, I know, um, is working with a couple different groups, including the League of Women Voters, one Wisconsin Institute in particular on redistricting. Um, we've, I know Andrew has been part of the Dane County redistricting, and a plug for my husband here, uh, who's a League of Women Voters member. He's also on the county board and introduced a redistricting proposal for Brown County. So. Um, so, <laughs> so yes, we're doing work on redistricting. Um, it's primarily in Milwaukee, Dean, and Brown counties right now, but I know they're looking to expand. So, um, but that's very, very important, especially for making sure, you know, um, the rising American electorate uh, was one of the few groups that uh, in the 2012 lawsuit for redistricting, they found, yes, you discriminated against Latino voters in Milwaukee. So it's very important for the rising American electorate redistricting, so. I don't know. Oh, sure, I don't care. <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm just curious. There are always, um, one of the things that they measure is unmarried women. Do they measure unmarried men? Um, so the census, you can find out unmarried men. Um, this is getting like a little C3 and wonky, but um, there's certain groups that, this, that the IRS will only allow you to spend money on registering people to vote. Um, and it depends on if they are underrepresented when it comes to elections. So there was a, so a, a, I guess, 
the IRS doesn't let most C3s spend money on that, so which, so which I would assume then that they're not underrepresented. And actually, this is a conflict. Um, I used it for presentation purposes, but in 2014, you could target unmarried women. But in 2015, the IRS said, no, we really don't feel like un unmarried women are underrepresented, which we feel like when you look especially at spring elections, that's not the case. So um, yes, there's data on unmarried men Yes, you can find unmarried men when you use databases like the Voter Activation Network. Um, but when it comes to, is that something C3 allowable in terms of targeting the IRS? That's where uh, I would talk to Andrea about. So, <laughs> yeah. So. Um, just a little comment on the using social pressure. There's research also on the on the value of the word because. Mm. Okay, so if you that if you use the word because when you're trying to convince people to do something, they are more likely to do it than if you just say to do something. Okay, there was a study that that had somebody making copies at a copy machine. If somebody walked up and interrupted them, they wouldn't let them make copies, but if somebody walked up and interrupted them because of any reason, you know, because I have to get to lunch, because I have work to do, because my children are teething, um, <laughs> it, regardless of what the because was, they would let them interrupt and copy. So wow. I think that's really important with using social pressure is coming up with a reason because. It's important for you to vote because your generation will be running the country soon. <laughs> That's an awesome point. Thank you. I'm glad she brought that up because, um, <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah. I didn't mean that. Um, but staying positive is really, really important. And one of the things I'm doing um, with a website for a, a, an independent group that does registration, um, it's called Supermarket Legends. And if anybody's interested, I'll tell you why. Um, but what I've started doing, and I did this in response to a specific group that I spoke to about democracy and voting, and that was the Milwaukee Muslim Women's Coalition, which has been organizing for about 20 years. And a year ago, I moved to a new location, and it's, I'm two miles from their center. So I gave them some of the league uh, voter ID sheets so that they have them. Um, but when I spoke to them, I changed the, the framework. Instead of talking about voting as a right or a responsibility, which nobody would come to a party if you told them that, um, I've, I've started only talking about celebrating democracy and about the joy of casting a vote in a democracy. And that means also talking about how democracy is never finished, that it's a constant growing thing, that it needs attention, um, and that it's fun. And it can, it'll open your horizons and, and things like that. And I've gotten pretty good response on that. People sort of sit there and they say, what are you talking about? And then the more I can get into examples and the becauses, um, the more it makes sense. And I've decided from now on, I mean, that's what's on the website. And the website is legendsvote.org. Um, you might get some ideas from there, but keep in mind that organization is not a C3 or a C4. It's just an independent group. Nobody gets paid. So you'll see a few teeny little instances of partisan stuff on there, but there's a, it's mostly nonpartisan stuff. So you got a good stuff, good things to choose from. That's that's awesome, and I love how you talk about like I I met with the group, I listened to what their needs and what they want for their community, and I adjusted accordingly. That's that's perfect. That's great. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure I know what are the needs of young people. We go into the high schools to register, and I don't know what's on their minds. Um, and I'm sure I could ask, but I'm not too sure I'd get the feedback I need to work off of that. So is there any place I can go to look? Where would I go? Yeah, no, that's a great question, especially it's 
Like, you know, you don't want to go to your grandson and tell me what's the needs of 18 year olds. Like that's kind of an awkward, not natural conversation. I would encourage you to reach out to Wisconsin Voices. I think um, they do a lot of, they have a lot of meetings, but um, you know, <laughs> they have a lot of meetings, but they create a lot of really good safe spaces to have these conversations because sometimes these can be really uncomfortable discussions. They can, you know, sometimes people bring up issues that you weren't prepared to discuss. And um, so I think, you know, reaching out to Wisconsin Voices because they do have uh, youth groups like the Urban Unger Underground UW Council of UW students. Um, you know, I would reach out to them and talk about what are they hearing, when are they having meetings, you know, can I attend um, would be great. So, Just to respond to how to reach the youth, um, the National League has a really good resource, Empowering Youth Voters. You can get it on their national website and download it. And in Milwaukee, we make pre presentations to the high schoolers, and we use a script that we've adapted from that. And in the beginning, we ask what they, what's important to them. And the one thing that always comes up is other high schools have better lunch <laughs> um, and potholes. That, oh, that's yeah. universal. But we talk about you know jobs, minimum wage, uh, access to education. Uh, and when you get the first from them what's important in a classroom presentation, then it's a lot easier to talk about why, why voting is important. And then you can do the because mm -hmm. and that. But check out the National League website. Sometimes it's really hard to find stuff on there. <laughs> I, I know I'm the only person that has that problem. <laughs> but... Um, Empowering the youth vote. And then I'll bring, the, after lunch, I'll bring a, a toolkit that we share with all the high schools in Milwaukee Public Schools. Is there one? One right here. Okay. I have a, just sort of a comment, maybe a question related to the Asian American community. Um, in all of the media, the, you know, the, the Hispanics are talked about and the blacks, the Asian Americans are not mentioned. My son-in-law is Asian American, so I just wondered if you have any comment on that. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point, and I think groups like Asian, you know, API Vote are really trying to change that. Actually, this week they just released a new PSA specifically about voting um, because um, they do feel under represented at least when you know when I talk to Zong Chang and my who and my own family I have Asian API uh, members of the community in my own family they definitely see and feel that too so yeah that's very valid I think it would be very valuable to go into the high schools in your county where you are because at the junior senior level you have, you have government classes and civics you could cover the entire class, uh, uh, five or six classes of students uh, at that time. And uh, the teachers really like to have speakers come in. We had uh, some people from our league go into uh, government classes and talk about the league. And the, uh, I'm sh sure the teacher really appreciated that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, we have time for one more. I have a wonky question. Sure. On the Milwaukee chart that you showed, mm -hmm. the, um, Milwaukee's doing a good job within the black community of increasing percentage voters. It looked to me like women were, you had 58,000, 55,000, I don't recall, women, black women who voted, 33,000 black men voted. Yeah. Um, is that due almost exclusively to the higher incarceration rates of black males in Milwaukee, or is there another thing at bay? Yeah, um, no, a lot of it is due to incarceration rates. Um, also, um, so there's some really great, oh, I can't remember her, Chanel McLeod, what's her organization? Um, but she's doing a lot of work with um, ex-felons and parolees. Um, so is um, nine to five as well in terms of like ban the box programs. And you know, when we talk to Chanelle and who works primarily with ex-offenders, she, she does believe that is a lot due to incarceration rates. And actually, uh, when we talked to 
um, volunteers and other people that are a part of her participation, we had a great event at the Capitol once where it was an ex-offender and he said, you know, I, I wasn't sure if I could vote and so I didn't vote for 12 years because I was just so scared. And um, um, Rachel from Joshua in Green Bay, she also talks about a lot of times with ex-offenders, um, and I will say working for the state, DOC did not do a good job for a long time keeping records of when um, someone um, could vote after um, being um, released on parole. So I will say part of this is the DOC, they've gotten a lot better with their data, um, but still a lot of ex-offenders are just really scared, um, you know, because voting could, could send them back to jail. So there's a huge, uh, a lot of education that needs to be done, so, yeah. Colleen, we have, um, the audience would like your contact information. Oh, yeah. Um, so you can email me actually. So even though I've been married like a year, I haven't changed everything yet. And <laughs> so my email is Adams, A-D-A-M-S, and then Colleen, C-O-L-L-E-E-N, and then E as an elephant. So Adams Colleen E at gmail.com. So you can see the sacrifice going from Adams to Grzynski. So, <laughs> so. There's some funny stories at the Social Security office. If you want to hear those later, I can tell you those. So, but yeah, thank you.